Have you been in here before? No, this is this really nice. I don't want to like walk around. Yeah. That's one of the reasons we decided to hold it over here. Yeah, that's awesome. No. <laughs> Yeah. Are you all ready? Yeah, I'm good. Well, this morning to kick us off is Dr. Jenny Vanos out of the Department of Geosciences at Texas Tech University. Jenny will talk to you more about her background and interest, but I'm glad she's able to come. She has a student defending his PhD this afternoon, so it's a busy time for us. And, uh, so, Jenny, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hold on. Uh, yeah, and we, and I'm sure it was communicated to you, but we've been asking people to talk about their background. And yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think I've got, I've got a couple slides on that. So hopefully it's good. Okay, so welcome everyone to Love It. I know some faces here and then don't know a lot of others. So welcome. I hope you've been enjoying your time here. Um, I'm an assistant professor here in atmospheric sciences, and I've been here for almost three years now. And so I was asked to talk both about um, my background and experience and early career um, kind of trajectory. And I would say I'm still early career, so <laughs> that's good. And then um, climate and health. And my main focus in climate and health research is on extreme temperatures, and I use a lot of instrumentation. So Derek asked if I would bring some of my instruments from my lab here. Um, to show you how we collect data in the fields for um, urban heat island kind of research. So I'll start out with first some of my early career experiences. So I was at the University of Guelph. Uh, hmm. Interesting. Um, the title isn't showing. So I was at the University of Guelph for almost eight years. I did my undergrad in the School of Environmental Sciences. Um, I was also a microbiology research assistant. These slides are being weird. Um, so you can see in my undergrad, I had some field experience setting up at Ecovariant Systems and Cloud Science Tower um, there. So that was a really neat experience for me to see. But like instruments, um, ultimately, that's not the way I went with um, these slides are not looking the same. Okay. That's not the way I went with um, my career, but I fell in love with weather in my undergrad and decided that was the way I wanted to go. And then um, I was offered a really neat PhD position um, studying thermal comfort and extreme heat in humans and getting to use a lot of the research equipment that I wanted to. So I looked at um, heat stress um, outdoors in urban areas and emergency preparedness. Um, one of the reasons I really liked that project was because I was a runner, so the entire time I was doing my undergrad and PhD, I was competing for the University of Guelph, and I competed for my province, and, my, um, and actually my country at Pan Ams at one, one point, so I was really driven to understand um, physiological processes also during extreme heat, so that was fun. So that was all in Canada, and I was stayed in Canada for my postdoc and uh, went to work at Health Canada, actually, which was an interesting position in the government. And so I did research in the Environmental Health Science Research Bureau, and it was a pretty good experience. Um, after about three or four months, I realized government wasn't for me. Especially at that time in Canada, we had a prime minister who was not on board with anything in climate research. So um, getting our papers through the initial internal review of the government was tough. We were not allowed to use the word climate or change <laughs> together. And I was also, um, it was an interesting experience because I, I, I got a lot of work done, but it wasn't as creative as I would have liked to be during my postdoc. Um, I think in academia you get a greater chance to, to kind of do what you want, but 
as a in government, it's more you're on a, uh, a government project uh, pushing for the agenda of power, it felt like. And I was also told after about three or four months that to stop being so ambitious because that was going to get me in trouble. And so I went, oh my gosh, this is not for me. So I started looking for jobs back in academia because I missed teaching and all that kind of stuff. And um, I, I also did, in between this job um, in Health Canada, I went down to Miami and got some experience as a visiting scholar there. And I think that position is what really kind of boosted me up and got me going um, on the trajectory back towards academia. And it allowed some of the employers that I was applying to to see that I could move around different places and work with different people and adapt to new places. So that was me. And then I ended up here in 2013. In August, I started as assistant professor in atmospheric sciences, but also working really closely with everyone in the Climate Science Center. So I was hired largely to bridge that gap between weather and climate on campus. So that was fun. And my main area that I work on here is human biomineralogy and urban areas, and that's what I'll talk to you about a lot today um, under the lens of climate change. Um, so I'll, um, I'm saving a, hopefully have a half an hour at the end for anyone who has questions about any of that, and then I'll kind of jump into how I got into this and, and what the passion or where the passion began and why it's important and then the instrumentation that we use. So um, I study biomineralogy or bioclimatology, so I'm looking at the impacts of weather and climate on people's health pretty much, so the atmospheric processes. Um, so we often ask the question, how does the weather or climate impact the well-being of a certain population. It could be a, uh, the entire population, it could be a subset of the population. Um, and um, mainly I focus on the impacts of extreme heat and air pollution. Um, so in today's talk, I'm going to start big and then kind of go small. So the, the reason heat waves are studied so much and the reason it's so important to understand them and the synoptic air mass work, some of it that I've done, and then going down to the urban heat island, at the city scale, and then go down even further to human microclimates and why I brought some of these instruments here today. So we know heat waves are a big deal and um, the Southwest has been having them for a little while. I don't know if I'd want to be in 120 degree Fahrenheit weather. Um, I, I don't think I'd survive. <laughs> so um, a few things have come up over the past few years. Obama um, uh, initiated the Climate Health Summit and within that plan, he said, we want a new national integrated heat health warning system, which you can see here in the bottom left corner. And so this started to be developed last year in Chicago. Um, last year in Chicago, it was the 20th anniversary of the Chicago heat wave, where um, in 1995, 700 people died due to the heat. Um, and I think John was telling me he remembers that very yeah, well. Yeah, I'm in Chicago and we're in heat wave. So a lot of us might not remember that. Um, I certainly don't. Um, but 20 years later, now we're kind of developing this integrated heat health warning system, not just for heat waves, but looking long term into the impacts of climate change. And they also want to be able to say three, four, five, how, how far in advance can they have these um, warnings in place for different sectors of um, the city? So urban planners and water and power and public health. Um, not just for people like you and I. So this is why it's called the National Integrated Heat Health Warning System, and we're kind of pushing that forward now and holding workshops and all that kind of stuff. Um, so over the years, we've seen things like this with Australia having to put a brand new color on their color map because they didn't have that color um, until a couple summers ago um, on their color maps, so they had never seen temperatures like that. So we know it's getting hotter. But we also know that people are extremely impacted by the heat. And this is the top 10 um, deadliest heat wave in history. So the top one is the most well-known, the 2003 European heat wave, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. And then the most recent on there is the Indian heat wave um, in 2015. 2,500 people um, perished. Um, so it's a big deal. And in the US, it's also a big deal. And you should you think, oh, this shouldn't really be happening, right? So extreme heat kills approximately 3,200 people in the U.S. So during my PhD, I kind of started small scale, and then I started reading literature on some of this kind of stuff, and I got really, really, really involved in that. 
And I actually didn't mention, I, I did start out as a master's student, and after about four semesters, um, I had published and started looking broader scale, and my committee said, let's just put you into a PhD now. So I actually didn't do a master's, I rolled up into a PhD. I was very fortunate, but it took me a very long time to decide that. Um, and it, one of the reasons that um, they wanted to put me into PhD was because I started looking broader and the other students weren't doing that. I started really seeing where my research applies, not just at the fine scale that I was working at, but at larger scales in cities and around the world. Um, so when we see statistics like this, that's when I start thinking, wow, why does this happen? And so this uh, figure is from the most recent um, United States, so the USGCRP. And again, it's showing Chicago there um, and how many people died during that heat wave. And then you see plots like this, and this is from Catherine, um, that historically extreme heat is not that common. Um, if you look at days over 100, but if you look at what happened in 2011 or what can happen in the future with our lower scenario, we see these days increasing. And then we see scary plots like this, that the higher we go, the number of days over 100 is increasing. Um, and that can be scary. Um, especially when we see the number of people dying during heat waves. So the question then is, if we've committed to a certain trajectory, how do we adapt? And if we um, can possibly do so, can we mitigate so that we stop this from happening? So those are the kind of questions that go on in my head all the time. And adaptation with um, urban heat island mitigation techniques is the way, the, the place I find myself most of the time these days. And how can we adapt at the small scale um, and then have those changes accumulate to be bigger, positive changes on a larger scale across the city? And that's why I'm going to talk about the urban heat island in a minute. But first, I did get to do some work um, in synoptic air mass climatology, um, climate change and air pollution. This is just one of the figures that we created from a, a big report for the Union of Concerned Scientists in 2012 where we're looking at the changing frequency of air masses across the U.S. and here we're looking at the moist tropical plus air mass. So an air mass is really, really hot and really, really humid and how frequently has it been present in St. Louis over the last 60 years. So this is extremely a simple plot to make, but it's showing exactly what the plots that you might see from other research scientists like Catherine showing an increasing trend of the hot humid air masses or the hot dry air masses and actually then obviously a decreasing trend of other air masses which were our polar our colder air masses throughout the summer. And in conjunction with this I did this all across the Midwest and then um, did the same kind of plot all across Canada and found similar results even especially the further we go north we're seeing these trends um, become stronger and more significant in terms of rising warm air and then following trend in that polar air. Um, and then because these air masses, my, my advisor at Health Canada really liked the use of these air masses, so we started combining it with air pollution and mortality data and looking at the trends across Canada for the last 20 or 30 years of what is the connection and the interactions between the air mass and air pollution and human mortality um, at different age levels and Different, uh, different health outcomes, so we looked at respiratory versus cardiovascular. So that's when I really got to start working with real health data, which was really fun. Um, and um, I haven't done as much epidemiological work since leaving Health Canada, um, but it's something that I think um, it's important to understand, but at the same time you'll notice that my research is kind of going back down to the individual level to answer some of the, the bigger questions. So I like to use this plot, Catherine might have used this this week, but preparing for the increasing temperatures because it's really not much different than what I just showed you. But here we're looking at the maximum and the variability. And so then when I look at this and we stretch out, we stretch it out, we see the range increase, and then we see larger extremes. So what, what I'm really focused on is those top peaks of energy temperature. Or what is that maximum temperature that someone's going to have to deal with, and how can we adapt and prepare so that they are, they are so impacted by it. So I see this and I see our rising temperatures and then also on top of the rising temperatures, we have our anthropogenic heating, such as what's going on in the urban heat yeah. So I kind of look at it as climate change, maybe plus two degrees. 
plus the urban town and say, all right, how can we think about mitigating both of those? Um, so everyone is probably well aware of the urban heat island effect, just those differences in temperatures from the rural area to the urban area. This can vary quite a bit throughout the year and then throughout the day and then overnight. It's the greatest overnight. And so in, in terms of um, this, we know that it's higher usually in the urban area. In the downtown, we can have little cool pockets, we can have little hot pockets. We want to understand how can we make more cooler pockets in the hotter cities and get rid of those hotter pockets. So in terms of the urban heat island, we know it's amplified by population growth and climate change. Um, right now, 50% of the world's population lives in cities, and that's just going to keep increasing. Um, and a lot of urban areas commonly lack vegetation, so it's really high thermally massive materials that are absorbing a lot of heat during the day and then emitting it overnight. And that's why you see the highest intensity overnight. So with a lot of our work, we're seeing this increasing importance of understanding the canyon geometry and the radiation fluxes that are going on inside the canyons, and then also understanding the difference in day versus nighttime. Because when you have a heat wave and the temperatures aren't dropping overnight, that's actually when we start seeing the highest number of deaths. After three or four days, we see this light effect where the maximum deaths occur three days later after a really strong heat wave that um, we're not seeing the temperatures cool down overnight. So this is really common in humid areas. So if you're from a humid area, you know that overnight the temperatures don't drop very much. We all notice here in Lubbock, it's pretty dry, the temperatures drop very nicely at night. And so we actually, in terms of look, in looking at the data here in Lubbock, we're okay for the heat actually, which is the good to see. Um, but a lot of that is because we don't see the really high overnight temperatures. Um, they, they drop my sleep. So I wanted to give you kind of an example study um, that we did in the Northeast. We looked at Philadelphia, New York, Boston, and Baltimore um, to understand the spatial and dynamics of the urban heat island um, under these different air masses that I've mentioned. So how does it vary if it's a moist air mass versus a dry air mass, let's say. And so we have this data, so I'll go back here, from Earth Network and Weather Bucks, and uh, they set up these stations about nine years ago, ten years ago now. Um, and in New York, we had 243 stations to use, um, just little Weather Bug weather stations. Um, they're still up. In uh, Boston and, and the other cities, there's about 150 or 200. Um, obviously, we didn't use all the data from every station because it wasn't all complete records, but we used um, all the stations that we could that had the full eight or nine year record. So I wanted to give an example of, of how we looked at this, and this is work from one of my master's students um, uh, last year. So if we look at the difference in the dry tropical and the dry tropical air mass over New York City, we can see that the, um, these are just the absolute temperature values. We're not looking at uh, intensity or anything. So if the temperatures are much higher, or a little bit higher in the white tropical. Um, so that's interesting to see. And then we, it looks a little bit different on my computer, but um, you can start seeing pockets of hotter areas in the city under moist tropical, and then those pockets actually change under the dry tropical air mass. And what we also looked at was that that signature. We think we really think, okay, the urban heat island is just this nice up plateau down. But it's not always that way. It depends on the way you look at it. So we could put um, here, you can see I have just a thick black line here. Those, um, using that line, we see this kind of urban heat island signature, but then using another line, we see a completely different one. So it's all dependent on what, what way you decide to look at it. So we're starting to plot these in 3D so that we can look at an actual surface and then see how it's changing in all the cities under the different air masses during the day, overnight, because when you talk to someone in an urban planning or in public health, what they actually want to know is what are the hot spots in the city that we need to be focusing our resources. So it's really fun to get a chance to interact with the stakeholders and they see this data um, and they say, okay, that's really cool. All right, so let's go figure out exactly where that is and what is it like there? How much impermeable surface is there? Um, so far, we've done some work in Toronto too to see how canopy cover relates to the number of emergency um, distress calls during a heat wave. And we find the more canopy cover, the less calls the tracked, which is interesting. And 
the less permeable um, or impermeable surfaces, the less pulse in that sense track. So we start to see these connections to urban design and the urban canal effect, and then to human health, which is interesting. Okay, so, but answering the bigger questions, we have to actually go down to the micro scale. So um, getting into collecting data with, um, for temperature, radiation, air pollution. And that connects to these urban canal and health adaptation measures and specific impact to human health and infrastructure. So I mentioned the radiation in urban environments, and that's extremely important in developing that urban development. We have the radiation come in, it hits a building or is absorbed by the building, it bounces off or it's emitted off, and then it hits another building. And we call that radiation trapping. So um, as the day goes on in the morning, um, both heating up and heating up, and then overnight we'll start emitting that. And it obviously depends a lot on the type of material of the building, if it's concrete, if it's brick, if it's glass, it's going to be very different. Um, but we're really focused on understanding the mean radiant temperature in different locations in a city. Because it's actually under hot conditions, the mean radiant temperature is the most influential variable on heat stress. And so what the mean radiant temperature is, is that combination of all the um, energy fluxes towards you and away from you in terms of radiation. So your long wave, your short wave, um, at you and away. And the way we model it in a canyon is with a little cylinder. And so that's why I brought this instrument here, because this is how we try and collect um, our mean radiant temperature data. So we're getting the radiation absorbed by a cylinder, a human and the air temperature also both impact, so we call it the radiant temperature. And so other instruments, and I'll explain more about that in a minute, other instruments that we use, um, my favorite for radiation, and this will get you all your boxes, is the net radiometer. And so we can set this up, and then we get our incoming solar and our outgoing solar, incoming long wave, outgoing long wave. So you have your, your glass domes for your solar. Some of you might have seen this if you've ever taken that meteorological class, and then you have your silicone domes for your long wave. And so these are really, really nice to have. They get the whole full 180 of the sky, um, and they're really um, accurate and quick response, but they're very expensive. And so that's one of the challenges we have. You'll never, you don't even see these on um, a standard weather station at the airport. So it's hard to have this data um, at a fine scale that we want to see um, to understand the radiation fluxes in the urban area. So we've been starting to try and see what other radiation instruments can we use, and so that's why we started using the cylindrical radiation thermometer. So that's shown here. And we, this was actually created a long time ago by a few of my advisors back at my old university, and then um, I used it again for my PhD, and then started building them here in the lab at Tech. But essentially all it is, it is a copper cylinder filled with, um, you put a copper constantly thermocouple in it and you fill it with conductive epoxy and then you paint it to see the albedo of the human that you are trying to model. So you can do it different colors. The average human albedo of a clothed person is about 0.37. That's why we painted it that color. And then we can set this up anywhere in the data logger and start collecting the temperature data. And then as long as we know wind and air temperature, we can calculate the mean radiant temperature. This costs about $40 to make. That net radiometer is about $7,000 to put out. So this is why if we can start putting these out more, we can get mean radiant temperatures for our city. Um, so we're doing some tests to compare um, the net radiometers and uh, for measuring the cylinder to the cylindrical radiation thermometer and a couple other low cost options. Um, to see how accurate are they against the really expensive measurements versus the low cost measurements. And we've done some tests already, um, and we're just going to keep validating and try to put something out. Yeah? So most of the frequencies you got to be Whatever, I said it at one second, half a second. Yeah, I can do yes. that. But it, it will not respond, so um, the net radiometer will respond really quickly to cloud cover, let's say. But the CRT might take a minute or two to respond to something like cloud cover. So it does not have the, the quick response. At the same time, the, if we think about the general weather station, how quickly is it 
plus the data. We need quickets five minutes. A lot of time it just reports every hour. So if we can get something like the CRT or other low cost instruments working at rates the same as uh, weather stations, that would be really neat to have that data. The other one you see up here is the globe thermometer. And um, I'll let you guys kind of come see these or pass these around. Um, but who's heard of the wet bulb globe thermometer? No. So this is actually developed for the military for heat stress. Um, in the 1930s, um, finally applied, actually 1950, and then a lot of athletes and sports uh, events will use it, and there's actually a law in the NCAA that they have to have a wet bulb flow thermometer in that measurement, and that's how they call their, their practices. If, if it's too hot, they'll cancel practice or change practice time. Um, this is the standard globe that was created in the 50s, now you might see handheld um, uh, devices that people can kind of carry around with them. Um, but a lot of people want to use the, the globe temperature to predict the mean radiant temperature of a human. But this does not look like a human. So this is another one we're trying to test um, against the, the CRT actually and see if people are using this, is there a way to correct your data so that you're actually modeling a cylindrical human um, that's uh, the correct albedo rather than um, a globe per se. So all this is, it's a hollow globe, it's copper, it's painted a matte black, and you have just a little um, thermistor inside of it, and that just gives you a temperature, and you can imagine this gets really, really, really hot on sunny days. And so you, to make your wet bulb thermometer index, you combine it with a wet bulb temperature and an air temperature, and it's a weighted mean between the three. And that's all it is, really simply. But you have to have the air temperature and you have to have um, a wet bulb temperature and then the wind to be able to estimate the mean radiant temperature of that. And that costs about seven hundred dollars. So we're we're looking at uh, ways to to kind of understand more fine scale changes. Um, so we can set up this kind of weather station anywhere um, in an urban area. For the most part, we don't really leave it out for a long time, or you need someone with it. Um, unless it's on a roof because some of the instruments are really expensive. We also have set up all these instruments on a golf cart. Um, we did a lot of urban transect studies in Phoenix, um, trying to understand that. So, but the way I have traditionally applied this kind of data in my work is looking at the human energy budget model. So I can take all these different observations, um, connect it with some human physiological data, put it into our mathematical model called COMPA, and then out an energy budget that will tell me if the person is comfortable, if they're hot, if they're very hot. So again, here's your absorbed radiation and you can see that's actually still one of the most important variables in predicting heat stress on hot days. Then obviously your metabolism is a big part of everything, so the hotter, harder you're working, the hotter you're going to be. And then our pathways to losing heat, evaporation, emitted long wave radiation, and conductive heat. Under heat wave conditions, we actually see convective heat become a gain if the air temperature becomes um, a lot warmer than your skin temperature. So then we have two forms of heat loss. That's what we're interested in there. So we can, um, so in order to be able to model this, we need all the, the measurements that um, I've talked about here. So air temperature, wind, we need to know what the person's wearing, when, what they're doing. We need to know if they're in shade or the sun, so having the radiation measurements is really handy. We can use measurements from a CRT, and we model everything in the budget like a cylinder, so it's a human. So then if someone's sitting, we will model it differently than if someone's standing. So it's pretty neat to start to be able to play around with this in different applications. And I'll give you a few examples. This is an example from my PhD where we looked at four different parks in Toronto, and we wanted to understand the energy budget and parks and then also the park cooling island intensity. So how much cooler was it in the park than out on the streets? What was the energy budget of someone in the park than outside on the streets? And so how do you think we got these transects? Anyone read the thesis? <laughs> we actually threw a whole bunch of the instruments on a bike. And we did about 12 or 18 transects per park back and forth. Um, 
uh, to understand all the different variables. So you can, we actually have a big data logger right there. We're tracking the distance and location, uh, temperature and relative humidity, and then pyranometers for the radiation. So I was able to take all that. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is a neat experiment I did with another, um, actually a Masters of Land Geek Architecture student. Um, we were working on this together, so it's really interesting. So then you can see, this is just showing air temperature, but we could see uh, a park cooling down in intensity uh, from that park. Just a tiny little park, but um, the maximum intensity we saw in Toronto was about 7 degrees Celsius cooler in the park than outside on the streets. And you can also see here that we have this extension out into the street. So given the wind direction this day, these houses got a little bit of the cooling from the park. So the way I think about this in terms of an adaptation measure is, okay, we're providing a naturally cooler space. We're also um, providing cooler air temperatures here that will result in hopefully someone using less air conditioning um, during hot times, which is a good thing. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about air conditioning, but we are pretty interested in understanding how can we reduce the temperatures in urban areas so that we're not creating so much, much anthropogenic heat from our air conditioners, and also so that we're not putting so much stress on the grid because um, a few historical heat waves, including Chicago, have had, have had the electricity go out. And once we lose air conditioning, we start really losing people. So it's our number one adaptation measure. So if we can have more natural types of adaptation, this, that would be good. Um, and then other examples. So we've taken the weather station and um, did a study in Lubbock to look at all these different surfaces throughout a city um, and see under clear sky, high skewed sky view factor condition, what are the best surfaces. So we did green roof, we did white roof, we did, um, well, we looked at both good and bad. So here we have it over a football field that artificial turf. Um, and so I think we did 10 or 12 different surfaces. And we found green roof was really good and obviously grass was really good. The worst surfaces were the asphalt and um, the football field. Um, and so when we were out on this day on the football field, it was just over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And I could barely set up the station. Like I was just like tiptoeing around because it was so hot. Um, and so I went and got an a infrared gun to take the surface temperature. Um, and this was the worst surface in terms of uh, the absorbed radiation that a human would feel on that surface. You can just imagine. Um, and these artificial turf, turf surfaces have those little black pellets in them too. So it makes it a lot hotter. And the albedo is the lowest, it's about 90%. Um, but we can use just infrared guns like this to take a surface temperature and then see what the surface temperature is. You can do your skin if you want. Um, I'm pretty warm right now. Uh, but we can use these to get really fine cut scale measurements um, to see what the differences in um, urban uh, materials that are used are. So from um, we've done in children's playgrounds where we've looked at the extreme temperatures that children are exposed to on different days um, using that. So I'll let you guys play with that if you want. <laughs> so we're really interested when we do studies like this in understanding um, the microclimatic properties of it and what a human would be feeling over its surface so that we can reverse some of the um, uh, consequences of dark surfaces or lack of vegetation, anthropogenic heating, or the use of thermally massive materials, or the way we orient our buildings is really important too. Um, so, and the, I believe this is my last example. In the last few years, I've really started being interested in the effects on children. Because children are a lot more vulnerable than the average person to heat um, and air pollution. So worldwide, um, it's well known that elderly suffer the most during heat, but children actually are the next on the list in terms of the rate at which um, they undergo either illness or death during heat. Um, and so given the current understanding of how it will unfold, how climate change will unfold, infants and young children are actually um, likely to experience the greatest increase. So we um, started looking more at children's um, spaces and um, how started to see how children interact with the weather, how they're affected by the weather, how they perceive the weather, um, and other climatic atmospheric conditions. Um, so 
In terms of the um, playground study I mentioned, we were really interested in how can we apply principles of microcognitive and key design. So um, understanding um, how we can design to change the shade or change the surface, um, change the, um, I guess, principles in an area. We call this bioclimatic design because we're going to design differently depending on the climate zone we're in. So Phoenix will design very differently than New York. But we want to, we did the study in Phoenix to, on really hot days to understand this. So it's very obvious that um, a lot of dark <coughs> and metal surfaces can get really hot. But what's, what's less obvious is that some well-intentioned surfaces such as astroturf or rubber actually get the hottest of any. So these are some of our infrared pictures from um, our study in Phoenix. We did both the touch scale, we had that golf cart out getting all of our transactors apart, um, and then we had these infrared cameras. The hottest surface we found was the rubber. In this picture, it's 80 degrees Celsius. Um, when we used, um, when we did the touch scale measurements, it was 87 degrees Celsius. So kids burn themselves a lot in playgrounds. Um, the slides were 71 or so, 70 degrees Celsius. But the main takeaway here is you'll notice that half this slide is green and half of it is red. There was a shade sale at this playground, so we had the opportunity to study the effect of a shade sale on lowering the surface temperatures in that playground. And this is just an example of what shade can do in any area, um, but we were able to show how much it lowered the surface temperature. So then here it was about 42 degrees Celsius this day. Um, so by, low, by putting shade up, you can lower the surface temperatures to near air temperature, which made this playground then a lot safer for kids to play if they were out playing, um, made it actually usable. Otherwise, if you're in the sun, it's pretty much impossible to even play. So thinking about um, the, the place we're at with kids and obesity and asthma and, and all this kind of stuff, providing spaces um, using these principles of landscape design is really a neat area to be in to understand and to create these spaces that kids can actually use a lot more and safer. Um, you can go do a quick Google search if you want and see pictures of kids burning them, burning themselves in playgrounds. It's really not good pictures to find, um, but it happens a lot. So um, we focus in this. Actually, I, mean, I didn't mention we had this really neat overflight data where we had remote sensing data. But, um, uh, seven meter scale, we were able to compare a neighborhood scale to a seven meter scale to the touch scale and see how much error you might then see if you're using the wrong scale of data. So that was interesting as well. And the last study uh, I'll mention, very connected to that one, but now actually using real kids, um, is doing some personalized sensing of kids here in Lubbock. We did this this spring. Um, and what we're now doing is collecting individually experienced data of kids while they're playing in the playground. Um, what we had on them were heart rate monitors while they played, and we had eye buttons, which looked like this, so they all had eye buttons on their hips. And then they actually also all wore UVB dose meters, so we could collect the exact amount of UVB radiation they're experiencing while they're playing in the playground. So you can see some of that there. I'll pass those around too. Um, the I buttons are about $25 each. The dose meters are quite more expensive. They're about $350 each, so return that. <laughs> um, but it's really neat to see the data because most of the playgrounds in Lubbock have zero shade. You can go drive around and it'll be zero shade in Lubbock. It was really interesting because this playground had this one shade sale over this concrete stage where the kids actually were not allowed to play on. They're not, they weren't allowed to go up there. But for our study and for our kids, we did these different days of um, understanding the thermal comfort in shade and in sun. And so we actually got them to put four square in the shade with all these sensors on and then in the sun. So they're just playing, but that's under the shade veil. They're all wearing their instruments, and then you can see behind there, I'll show you in a minute. There was another group of kids playing in the sun. And these were on really hot days, which is that thing to go in the shade and really no. <laughs> and, then, and then we're on the switch. Uh, but we have the weather station set up too, so we're getting all this really great microclimate data.
data. And then we're getting their individual experience data under the shape bill. And then we also surveyed them to um, validate our model for thermal comfort of children. Because if you think of every single heat index that's been created, the parent temperature, um, our model, um, the wet ball flow thermometer, the Humidex, they're all created for like a 25-year-old male. So it's probably also why all the temperatures in rooms are set for male <laughs> comfort. Um, so girls will get cold really easy. Um, but so validating the models for um, real human responses in field studies is, is really valuable in the literature today. So um, um, I'm going to end there. And I know I didn't talk about too much outside of extreme heat. So this is the from the year two report, all in for climate drivers and the pathways to different um, uh, health uh, endpoints. So if, if you want to talk about any of these two over the next 25 minutes or so, we can. Um, I know my colleagues in future climate infections will be on Friday morning, so we don't need to talk too much about that. But if you want to talk about air pollution, I can talk about that, or more about heat and cold. So whatever you guys want, we can, we can talk. So, yeah. So, first off, oh, how long ago, like when did you do the uh, stick and putting for children playing in the summer? That was in May. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, are you planning on, you know, once you have some good results and data, on are, you planning, are you planning to take that to the city? And We're actually really working hard right now to get things okay. over the actual equipment there. It's interesting, Lubbock has, a few years ago, they built, um, I don't know, over 50 new playgrounds. The playgrounds are outstanding if you go look at them and you look at how brand new they are. Um, they were, I think, $93,000 each is what I read in a news article. Yeah, there was a, there was a $5 million bomb issue for Yeah, but I, unless it's during school time, there's no one out there playing. And the, if you look at the way they're, they're designed, whether like winter and summer, it's there's no wind blocks in the winter and there's no shade sails in the summer. So there's so much that can be done for these spaces so that they can be used more um, safely and that kids will actually become comfortable when they go to them in terms of microclimatic design. And kids aren't going to think this way, but this is, I can't drive by a playground anymore without thinking this. Um, usually I'll show a picture uh, when I travel. I'll run, and then when I run, I'll take pictures, and then I'll take start taking pictures of the playground. Which sounds creepy. But <laughs> <laughs> so I'll have, I have pictures from Sweden and Germany and Korea now um, of these how differently the playgrounds are designed, and the different kind of equipment that's used, and how much they focus. They use completely different surfaces, and they'll um, really maintain their tree canopy cover. And it's really interesting to me. Um, and last summer, because I was so interested in this and, and why playgrounds here designed so differently, I got my certification as a playground inspector. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to know what goes into them saying this playground is safe versus this playground. And rubber is a surface that they sell you, you should use if you can. Um, as for trips, okay. You're not allowed to use grass in the normal playing area. Because apparently it's too hard to fall on, which, okay, I understand there's a lot of other situations that they're more worried about in terms of kids hurting themselves in the playground. So, soft surfaces was a really important one. Um, but you see all these, like they, they didn't talk about shade once during the entire training that I had, which um, I would love to be able to take this research then and put it into their guidelines and put it, put it into their training so that this is on the mind of people who are designing the playground. And playgrounds is just a really neat example of um, um, one little spot in an urban area where a lot of what we're learning there can be applied elsewhere. So why do you use metal benches? Or why don't you shape this bench in this kind of organization? Um, in Phoenix, we're working on the thermal comfort of bus stops because um, people spend a lot of time at bus stops in Phoenix and it's really hot. And, they're designing new shape sales structures for the bus stop. So that's one example of where we can apply some of this information um, in a really hot place. Yeah. Um, have we done any large scale studies, for example, a statewide study? And if you did, how would you go about it? Like, do you think using uh, more sensing imagery would be 
Yeah, we wanted well, we want to get more uh, data for other cities using this um, minor scale remote sensing data alongside the touch scale data um, because right now we only have it for Phoenix. And so we'd like to expand it to different cities and different climate zones um, because obviously we're going to think very differently the way we design um, these urban spaces and places further up north than in Phoenix where it's sunny and hot all the time. Um, if we're thinking about Toronto, we can't just put up shade everywhere because in the winter people actually really need the sun. So then you start thinking, okay, this is just trees, how am I going to orient this so that it provides the most shade in the summer and then it sheds its leaves in the winter and then still can provide the sun. Um, so we're thinking more climate zone comparison wise rather than full state wise. Um, uh, but that would be. But uh, NASA is developing a lot of new platforms to put on their um, their planes so that we can get actually even finer scale data. So we do have a proposal in the map right now to hopefully get some money to do more of this work in different cities. Yeah. Yeah. And how much do you think the government is willing to invest in that sort of a computer system that generates real time heat? I think a lot. It, yeah, the National uh, Integrated Field Warning System is ran through NOAA, the government, and they're putting a lot of um, emphasis on this to start doing the work. Um, they don't have much funding yet, um, so if, if they want to do something like that, they're going to have to come up with more funding for the initiative. But um, a lot of, I mean, there actually might be some cities that already have some real-time data uh, for people to see, um, but it would be neat to be able to see those maps and urban planners and city-level type people are the most interested. So that kind of um, uh, result could come from the city level. So the, the sustainability offices or urban planning offices, they are the ones that are most interested and they might be the ones that need to find it. Um, a lot of these new, you know, urban down mitigation measures and techniques, they come from below, from the local state or local governments rather than above, from the federal government. So, yeah, but that's kind of that's what a lot of people's goals are to be able to have either a really nicely validated work model predicting all the temperatures throughout an urban area, or more data from stations. Um, High high end weather stations that are you know backyard weather stations. Yeah, because we can all go on weather underground and go look at a bunch of backyard weather stations, but the validity of the data is always going to be a question for those ones. But if these are on routes or they're ran by um, the National Weather Service, say, then, then that's the kind of kind of data that we can use to do actual studies with. Because there's lots of studies looking at um, different neighborhoods and different temperatures in neighborhoods and health outcomes and finding that the lower income neighborhoods have less green space and more concrete and then they're also suffering the most because they don't have air conditioning um, and it's hotter. Yeah. So there's lots of, uh, most of those cities also come from Phoenix but there's others throughout uh, Indianapolis and Florida. So that's the kind of information that city level players want to know. I was curious if, so it sounds like shade is really like your, your big. It's my big. Well, so, in a place like Lubbock, yes. And Phoenix, that's, that's the number one way to, yeah, improve an environment. So I guess I was I was interested, is there, and are there any other things that are sort of counter conservation wise to what, like a, a urban heat island context, like in Las Vegas, pushing towards zero C, is yeah. that sort of increasing your solar radiation, your net solar radiation? That's a good question. Zero scaping, and, and I've learned recently it's very different depending on the city you're in, but I know the zero scaping principle is best for Phoenix. And one of the, I reviewed a paper like four years ago on it, and you know, they're interested in what's the, how much water, because it's all for water saving, right? Because it's hard to grow grass in some of these places. So, how much less water will you use for zero scaping? But then if you do the calculations or you do the measurements of the amount of radiation and how much hotter it's going to get around the Sarasquake property, 
then you're actually increasing the heat load on your house. So you have this trade-off, and I haven't seen a, a great study yet that's been able to do this great this trade-off between the, the water use for cooling your house versus the water use for watering your grass. I know. So I mean, yeah, John might know. No, as, as a gardener, I, I know for every height of tree yeah. uh, you put, you actually decrease your energy use in your house by a lot of percent. So then there's the shade again. Just because the shade going during the summer. But it's hard to grow a 40 foot tree over that. Right? Well, yeah, <laughs> no, 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 you know, but that, you know, but that, but that is, it's just, that's the trade off. And, and so and that's part of the problem that's happening here in Lubbock, too, as we're going more and more zero staking kinds of things for water conservation. Our heat island effect is going on. Yeah. We don't have enough transpiration, and it's not enough evapor transpiration in the landscape because that agriculture the coolest down either. Yeah, so it's um, that's a, a really interesting area of research right now. I think I think we need better data from residential areas to understand how water is being used in the home, um, and then more studies understanding. And that would be a really neat study to propose actually, just to do that comparison between. Um, especially Lubbock has some really good examples of Zara's being first of all grass, um, and you can I can I've talked to quite a few people in Lubbock who have nice big trees and nice yards and they don't worry too much about cooling. They don't have to cool near as much. I mean, the I'm really lucky in my apartment is really shaded and I can come home after no air conditioning all day and it's quite comfortable, which is nice. Grass will not cool. Yeah. So the lawns are the lawns are the grass to be wet. It's having, it's having trees and shrubs large enough to shade that level of transpiration to actually change that change that heat. Yeah, because when we actually put the weather station over dry grass in Lubbock, we didn't find that much of a difference between um, concrete and dry grass. Right? Because you need that moisture and you need that evapotranspiration to actually cool off the area, especially here. Yeah, so that's, that's a good, good study. Well, just to build on that comment, I'm at the University of Arizona. And oh, yeah. So I know a lot. Well, I mean, I know a lot of studies that have looked at the heat island effect and zero scraping. Well, and it seems like even desert environments, you can still have tr large trees. Yeah. That, and also, yeah. depending on the material that the buildings are built out of, yes. it also yeah. makes a really big difference. So that's a really neat, like, thinking microclimatic design. Um, you can go down to Phoenix or Tucson or Miami, and the way the houses are built and painted and structured are com completely different than here or north. The types of materials and roofing materials and colors you can very different and, and you see more houses that are going to be one floor rather than two and all these things to um, stop uh, the amount of heat absorption and how hot it gets in the buildings. Um, you, Yeah, I agree and I learned at a workshop last month that um, in Tucson they have a tree program and they'll give trees to people to plant and there's a 100% mortality rate on trees you give to people to plant because they're so hard to take care of in, in those environments. You need so much TLC for these trees, and, and you need to hire someone to see to, to do that. Actually, that's a good point. So, remember, I was talking about the 2011 John Deere Bay Orange yeah. Lake. Lubbock lost almost 50% of its trees in some way, shape, or form. You need like the city to really be on board with keeping the trees healthy because um, I probably couldn't even keep your life. I'm like pushing these trees in the urban areas. <laughs> I should probably take a course. But yeah, so that, I, I, I was so surprised when I heard that. Because Tucson is doing so much work in this area. University. Yeah. Have you thought about, um, you talked a lot about testing, thanks again, by the way, too. Yeah. Um, have you you've talked a lot about testing different surfaces, um, testing different landscape types. Have you thought about going the opposite route and testing different types of shade, like a tin roof versus a tree? Oh, yeah, yeah. So in the, so for that Phoenix study over the different surfaces, we had results for shade, shade or shale shade, tree shade, and then in the sun. And so then you can start to see um, over grass, and, and we tried to get as much as we could the same surface under the shade tail versus the tree shade. And it's so dependent for the tree on the type of tree. So if it's a big leaf tree versus a small leaf tree, and in Phoenix you have a lot of mesquite. And, Things like that, but if we were to go up in, into uh, the north, northeast, you're going to find a lot of the big 
basically trees that are going to provide a lot more shading. So there are a lot of tables out there that will tell you the transmissivity of a tree under different times of the year. It'll tell you when it leaps and when it loses its leaves and all that kind of stuff. That's really helpful um, in understanding this. But we can easily calculate the transmissivity ourselves with, with that same cool. diameter. So, but yeah, that, I mean, the, the shade type is really important. We can't just say go throw a tree up there because some of the trees, like that one right there, is not doing anything um, <laughs> in terms of shade, but maybe someday it will. Um, and then the orientation is so important so that it's blocking this out. Um, I can't now, every time I drive by a, a playground with a shade I like will analyze its orientation to the sun. I like, can't help it. Yeah. Um, so my question goes into what about like in central Texas or in California areas that you know their people are very specifically recommended do not keep trees next to your house because of what you have wildfire problems because you have a natural disaster you have the trees will fall on your house and where you might say. $3,000 yeah, you know, versus $50,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't know all the standards for that. Um, I mean, you can still have a tree quite a ways away from your house because I have shade, but at the same mm -hmm. time, the wildfire thing has never even crossed my mind as an issue. So thanks for bringing that up. I mean, hurricanes. And yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, hurricanes and trees. Yeah. So, um, I don't know what I've had to do with that. It's a good thing to think about. I've never been asked that. I don't know if anyone else has thoughts on that or knows some studies that have looked at that. Well, the American Horticultural Society has a lot of information on this. Oh, really? They do. Yeah, because, because the Horticultural Society is trying to figure out how to manage the whole yeah. thing of fire and heat and drought and hot. And so, they, and so those societies actually do a lot of science, the horticultural yeah. work, but it never makes it into the climate work. Wow, that's a that's interesting. Because yeah, yeah, yeah there are probably several recommendations on walking on trees in your backyard for like forest fires. Yes, or, um, yes, and also for you have a wide selection of trees for you know, different heights, yeah. and, uh, different care requirements, you know, pruning wise. Right, or, and so there is already uh, good recommendations. It should be from your state department. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, one of the problems too is with like your point to that tree idea. One of the things that like has <laughs> done yeah. is that it's gone away from big trees. I noticed that, like, you go to Tech Terrace and right. there's all these nice big trees, and that's the only spot where really they love it. Yeah, what they've done is they moved away from the big elms for whatever reason. Um, and, they, and they're planting a lot of a lot of smaller oaks, and they're, they're more shrubby oaks and whatnot. So they're not going to get very big. They're just for aesthetic pleasing rather than for shade the building. They won't, they won't fit and they won't do any shade. And part of it is just water use. They figure it's going to cost less water for a small tree. And but it's really changing the dynamic of what, and then, if you, you know, as you grow through tech, you see a lot of trees. What you don't know is three years ago, they cut down 100 pounds. Huge. They just sat right at the end of the line and they kind of lot. And they took out the whole middle part of campus and had to come back in and spend all this money putting what they did. And they put live oaks that only wouldn't come Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Lots of the general public. Um, with Catherine, I, she's helped me get like all these really great opportunities and talk to my first big Texas. And um, she came in and grad here and you know, science side classes. And so it's mostly been to the general public. I I haven't made it to the point where I feel comfortable like taking this to policy because I don't have enough data, I don't think. Um, so that has not happened yet. But that would be fun. <laughs> Um, a lot of even the state cell companies have contacted me because they're to, to them, I think it's a great thing for, for their kind of company, like some people from Australia and stuff. I think it's really good in Australia. Um, but yeah, mostly general public, and most people kind of uh, pick up because it's so I, I find it funny because I talk to it a lot, and everyone picks up all the shape sales and nice like playground and stuff. Um, so yeah, a lot of people in the community like it because they can apply it to their lives and their kids. 
and um, I'll use this in talks. You know, we spoke to Environment Texas at Earth Day Texas to teach them about some of the strategies that Catherine and I used to communicate some of the science to people. And um, my research is really good at pulling on kind of your heartstrings, your kids, right? If your kids are going to be exposed to the heat, it's not good for them. Air pollution is not good for them. Same, same with you, but people are going to take action more for their kids than themselves. And so some of the bigger messages and, and effects that you can use in getting people to change their, their way of thinking is through their kids, actually. So in terms of communicating, that's what I found really uh, impactful. Um, but it wasn't until about three years, when I came to tech, or right before I came to tech, I really started realizing a big gap in the literature for kids. And that we know so much about adults, yet kids are vulnerable, yet there's very few studies on understanding this. But uh, you have to go through IRB for some of this. Yeah. So um, we can only do so much with kids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, is urban compactness something that you consider to mitigate the problem? Because I'm from Turkey, and uh, yeah. in my country, almost all buildings are really tall, at least five stories, and they're really close to each other, which is a problem for. Um, um, a lot of uh, things, but if you're walking on the street, you get uh, uh, the shading from from the buildings, and I think a lot of the buildings they also yeah. provide shading for each other. Yeah, that's so. In that in that study that I showed you from New York, because New York also has that, I'm going to try and pull up a study about that. Um, New York also has a lot of um, building shading, and what we found. Specifically for New York is this um, urban cool island, cool island effect, where we do see lower temperatures in the urban area well, because of the buildings. So there's a cooling effect. So here we have this is the urban cooling intensity. The black is for nighttime, and the blue is for daytime. So what do you notice about the daytime? There's a whole bunch of temperatures that are negative. So quite a few studies have shown this, and it's in big cities like New York, like in Turkey, um, where we start seeing actually urban cooling island effects. Only in the daytime, though, you won't really see much at night. And there's quite a few reasons for that. Um, there's attenuation from aerosols from cars in the urban area that doesn't allow as much radiation in an urban area um, in some cities. Then you also have the shading effect that, that was mentioned. So. Um, just not getting, the, the buildings literally are just not yet exposed to um, radiation at the lower sun angles in the morning. So the cooling effect is greatest in the morning and then as you go over to the later afternoon you start seeing that urban down intensify. And then that's why it's greatest overnight too. Um, and then, quite a few studies have done this and I have that here. So you have all this energy stored in the daytime. I, did, I list studies here. Because most studies are done in Europe and around the world. I think the US can do a lot more work in this area to understand the, the urban cool island, cool island effect um, because it's this um, contradiction to what everyone kind of thinks about, which is a really um, area of research. Um, but lots of people have found this, but it's mostly starting in the early morning and going over yeah, into the early afternoon. So, but, then you even placements of your stations, right? So you might have a station that's always in, in shade um, versus another station that's always in sun. So you actually really need to understand the placement of your station um, in terms of why you might be seeing these results. But most of the time, the stations are placed on rooftops. Um, all these ones are at a height of two meters. And um, as far as we could tell from the pictures and from the information, they were not shaded. But like one was actually near this bridge that had a ton of cars on it all the time, and it was a hot spot. But that's because it was near all this anthem potential from cars, so we were able to explain that operation. So this is an example. Um, are there any concerns about damage to infrastructure as a result of extreme heat? And is that something that cities or developers are concerned about? Yes, so a really good example of that is um, that, that the map I showed you about Australia for the heat wave a couple of summers ago, um, they had all this warping of their train, train lines because it got so hot the material couldn't 
handle that heat. And so they were like spraying them off with water, but your whole kind of system has to shut down. That's a big one that cities are thinking about. Um, bridges, culverts, and Catherine and Anne in Stoner, um, she's doing all this work with engineers in the Northeast to understand the kind of materials they use and if what we're putting in place now can handle the temperatures 50 years from now. Um, you can ask Catherine when you see her, engineers will bring out this big book of laws they have to follow when they build a bridge or when they do something. They're made 50 years ago. They're not using data that they're going to, they're not planning for 50, 70 years down the line. They're using data from 50 years ago. Um, and so um, engineers have to follow these rules because if something goes wrong, they need to do it. And so they kind of have their hands tied. But then there's like Catherine and Anne doing this work to kind of try and show them, no, let's start thinking, you know, this break needs to last for 50 or 100 years. Um, it's got to use the right material to be able to withstand the heat. Um, or the new variability in temperatures and all that, road cracking, all that. So this is on the minds of a lot of people, I think. But maybe not, the engineers just can't do anything yeah. right now. <laughs> it's, it's kind of crappy. So we should be also thinking about extreme cold too. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. we, we know we're still hitting some minimum, but at the same time we're hitting what is it, like 7 to 1 now maximum minimum temperatures during the year, but we're still going to see extreme cold records. So that variability is really tough to handle for some cities that, that deal with extreme heat and extreme cold throughout the year. But same with people acclimatizing to the temperatures. So um, I'm from Canada. I don't handle the heat here very well at all. <laughs> I fight last night and I was like, oh my god. So, um, but so people and cities like as a, as a whole need to be able to withstand the variability. Yeah. So just a small question. So what is that? Putting wooden mobs 